everybody and welcome to the Art as Well. This is your source of inspiration, enlightenment and connection with artists throughout Ireland and indeed beyond. And in fact, this morning, just before we, we came on air, I was looking up some statistics uh, on, on what we've done since we started this, which is almost coming up to three years. I think it was uh, June 2020 when we started. And um, so far, we've had over 65,000 views. Uh, 11 and a half thousand hours of watch time and we've been viewed in 22 countries around the world primarily Ireland of course but also quite a substantial amount of people from the US the UK and Canada and then as far away as Australia Japan Switzerland South Africa I mean it's quite extraordinary the, the number of, of places that we actually reach and that's only growing as as, as we continue to to, to run the the art as well so you're all very welcome from wherever you are. And uh, I'm delighted that we have our guest today this morning, uh, who's Angie Shanahan. And Angie's from Cork, and she's a wonderful artist. Uh, I learned about her through a good friend of ours, uh, Bridget Flanner Flannery. And uh, so she's, I think you've cl collaborated quite a bit with, with Bridget. Um, and Angie has had work or has work in the OPW collection, uh, specifically the Michael Collins portrait that she was commissioned to do, which is in Dole Aaron. Um, but she's also got work at the UN Embassy in Washington, uh, Ballymaloo Cookery School, lots of private collections in Italy, Ireland, America, all sorts of places. So let's go straight down to Cork and say hello to Angie. Good morning, Angie. How are you? Good morning, Alan. And lovely to, to be here in this beautiful morning in Cork and actually terrifying to hear about all the countries that you're that you're yeah, I know. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I should have warned you about that. But I thought if I warned you, you'd be twice as bad. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's on the edited version. So don't worry about it. <laughs> but we do have somebody, a very special person from uh, Italy, which is one of your favorite places, I believe. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. We're yeah. Um, both of us, um, David and myself, we're Italophiles and we've been visiting Italy since pre-1990 when the whole kind of um, Pre, pre when the football mania took off. So we actually oh, yes. managed to get there before that and developed or our, our, started our love of the country. And uh, we, we go back there regularly. Um, yeah. I've been lucky to do residencies there as well, you know, so it's, it's definitely my um, go-to. I lo absolutely love it, you know, really love it. Yeah, that's great. I, oh, I, love I, say, I love it too. And I was there at, during Italia 90. And Were you? an extraordinary atmosphere. Really amazing. <laughs> I'd say it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Rome would be one of them. Um, I did a language course in it in Rome for a month, and um, so really got to know kind of areas outside the typical tourist sort of spots. Really, you know, because mm -hmm. we were staying in in an area north of the city, and mm -hmm. uh, just it it just opened up. We were able to discover lots of other places that we wouldn't have have known really, you know. But um, absolutely, it's one of my favorite cities, definitely. And do you get any of your artistic influence from there? Do you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I gave a talk to the um, Irlanda Italiana Association here in Cork in, in the City Library here in Cork, uh, 2019, I think it was. And it was just um, Catherine O'Brien, who would have been, she was professor of Italian in UCC and she was the um, she was the head of the department in, in UCC, obviously, as well there. But so and she was head of the Dante's Dante Alighieri in Cork as well. So I she opened an exhibition for me back in uh, 1992 or three in the Lavish Gallery. I was artist in residence at the time in the Lavish. And uh, so I had an, an exhibition at the end of that uh, solo show and uh, Catherine opened it. And they actually said in the Lavish at the time after, after the opening that she was one of the best openers they ever had. So yeah. uh, unfortunately, I didn't, I hadn't a recording or anything set up, you know, but um, yes. so yeah, so, you know, we've, going back to then, I've, Italy has been a huge influence in, in my work as well, you know. So I did a specific um, exhibition of work for the for the uh, to show it at the at the slideshow in the library, um, oh, which was yeah. great, you know. Yeah. We must connect so, you with uh, with Maria Gabriella uh, later yeah. later on after after the show, you know. Absolutely. So so t let's get back to the art business. Um, you, you you studied in the Crawford, is that right? Studied in the Crawford, yeah. I came straight out of school into into art college, and uh, you know, um, it was yeah, my my sort of three year in foundation year, and then on, on for the next three years, and then uh, did a foundation. I did a principles of teaching as well, which um, 
I was uh, the, the thing I really loved about that was I did some super eight filmmaking and oh. uh, did a series of, of short films, um, which I made during that was that was kind of really interested in me during that year. I never yes. actually kind of the teaching I went into then was more adult ed. And I did that for, you know, up until 2007. I was teaching all the time until 2007, adult ed. And um, so and what, what, what exactly does that involve? Excuse my ignorance. Oh, just just, uh, you know, classes set up in like one of the classes I did a series of classes was in UCC, you know, then in, in different different kind of schools or colleges I was doing, you know, the same College of Commerce, they might have a adult ed section, you know, where they'll have, ah, right. have you know, yeah. so it was one of, one of the courses that would have been put on, which mm. was basically, um, you know, learning, learning the principles of, of kind of, you know, creating, creating a piece of art, you know. Um, so that was one of the, the things I did until 2007 when I had a big exhibition and I just kind of put the teaching aside to concentrate on doing, you know, doing the work and the exhibition and everything because the exhibition was outside of a gallery space because I was doing it in the former, um, a former barracks in Ballancolic, which had been left. It was going through a transitional period. So the developer, Michael O'Flynn, had taken it on. And uh, so I lived in Ballancolic at, at the time. I had a studio which looked in towards the, the army grounds and the army grounds that uh, the trees would have been planted there in uh, the late 1700s. So yes. when, when I saw this was about to change, I just approached the developer and said, can I go in and do some work in there? And uh, so that was in 2007. And um, so I did a whole series of drawings and, you know, took kind of like, a, as I call it, a vehicle of information between photographs, drawings, everything. Yes. And, and then I met him again. I, I sort of probably was stuck at doing other work then as well. And then I met him again about a year later. And he said, are you going to do anything with this work? So I said, well, I'll, I'll, can I talk to you about that? So anyway, he sponsored the whole thing. Mm, and wonderful. he gave me yeah. space in Ballancolic as well, which was one of the new kind of places that he had, you know, one of the new buildings that he was doing there. Yes. And then, um, so Nula Fenton then did the forward and the and the catalogue, which uh, I think that's, right. might have that's, that's this this catalogue here, isn't that it? That one, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that that was a great exhibition actually, and it was just mm -hmm. 2007, just before the crash happened in 2008. You know, so yeah. it was just uh, the timing just worked, you know, because uh, uh, yeah. I think I have like more or less the sellout show of that one. You know, probably know. the last, my last one, but yeah. um, you know, so that that was a an amazing. Mm. sort of just a capsule of, of like an Eden state, an Eden-like state, which I, I kind of thought had to be had to be sort of captured really. And it has changed completely now, you know. Has it? Um, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So where, where are you based? I know you're at home at the moment because you're, you're the, the signal in, in your studio is very bad, as, as we discovered. Um, yeah, well, so, I think we have a little clip of that. that. Hmm? I think it might have been just bad. That There could have been a load of people using it because I checked it yesterday and it said very fast. So oh, really? <laughs> Yeah, so um, you know, whether it was just on the day, you know, because it was it was in the morning, there might have been a lot of drawing from it. But I, so anyway, but decided to do it here instead, then at home. Yeah, yeah no, um, no, I think I think you're right to do that. And yeah. tell me about where you are exactly, and and where the where the studio is. The studio is in the Backwater Artists uh, Group, which is um, in Wandsford Quay. So it's in one of it's really one of the oldest parts of the city because it's very close to Finbar's Cathedral, which is where the city started back, you know, and they I think there was a, a church there in the sixth century. And um, yeah. well, pre that, of course, the Vikings came in there. So the Vi there's a, an area close to there, which is Southgate Bridge. And the Vikings had their first sort of little port at oh. that in that section. Yeah. Yeah, port yeah, and a small, yeah. small hamlet, you know, in that section. Hmm. And then, of course, the, the town developed into the walls town between the Southgate Bridge and Northgate Bridge. And all the, um, you know, Patrick Street and Grand Parade and all these kind of streets as we know them now were canals. Mm -hmm. So which Cork was dubbed the Venice of the North. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, all the streets then bit by bit were covered over, you know. But yes. like, if you look at any of the maps, it was built on marshy ground. A bit like Venice, really, you know, and then mm. Venice kept their canals and we covered ours, you know, so <laughs> Venice has a bit more sunshine, probably, I'm sure as well. <laughs> oh, I think there is that. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So so is, is the Labbott Gallery beside you? The Labbott Gallery is underneath. So my underneath. studio is on, on the first floor and the Labbott Gallery is in the gallery which Nuala Fenton um, basically started her uh, gallery in, you know, I so see. she really 
got that space up and going and um, was leasing it from the city council. And uh, so I always remember um, at the time when she was creating the, the gallery space, mm -hmm. she had uh, she was thinking of putting a concrete floor, you know, instead of um, subsequently she had to, she put a wooden floor in there. But at the time, the councillors came over for something or other. The, 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 was some, one of the councillors was retiring and there was a talk. And one by one, I could see they were lifting their legs, you know, standing on the concrete. So after that, I think they decided we put a wooden floor in here, you know, and oh, uh, it's, yeah. it's a beautiful gallery space, you know, and the lab it now in there is, is it's a great, uh, it's great to have a, con a, la a gallery continuing on in there really as well. Absolutely. Um, and are there many people in your collective, the, the backwater group? There is, uh, well, on each floor, there's eight, there's eight studios, you know, oh, and um, hmm. yeah, so there's three floors. So there's eight artists in each, uh, and then over in the sculpture gallery, which is sculpture studio block across the way, there's, there would be another seven or eight over there. Yeah. But the printmaking, uh, printmaking studios are there also. That's a separate run organization, but it's all in under the um, city council. And yes. um, so you've got the gallery, you've got the printmakers, you've got, you know, there's a very active space. Mm -hmm. And as well as the people who are in the, the studios, there's now a, a, an artist network. So people can join the artist network. So, you know, if you don't have a studio in there, you can just, it's kind of a resource in terms of kind of information and everything like that as well, you know. So it's okay. a great, it's, it's a great organization really, it really is, you know. It's just uh, one, you, of, one of many. Yes, you, you, you've done, you did a quick video of um, the, the interior of your studio, which we look at now. I did, okay. yeah. So maybe you talk us through what we're looking at. I, and I know it's very difficult to see particularly well, but. Okay, yeah, so this is, you know, mm. just literally starting left to right to the, to, to, to the extreme left actually would be my sort of storage area where I keep all my canvases and stuff like that. And yeah. um, so just working the way around, I, I used uh, that wall for work, easels and the wall for working on, and then just hang some work as I'm, you know, just kind of sort of like sample stuff, you know, which the small pieces over on the left were. Um, and then just a little work table, two windows looking onto the courtyard. So the block straight opposite there is the sculpture block. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's coming around then again, that's that's the kind of side of the room I tend to work on mostly. Mm. And um, so I have another easel here. And if Kathy Bacon is looking in, Kathy, you might recognize this um, figure in the painting here, um, which is uh, it's actually, I was in Kilrelig last January and um, Kathy was there as well, and we really got to know each other. And uh, Kathy was going swimming, and I had this striped, uh, it's a kind of a satin style robe, which I was, uh, you know, needed a figure to model. So on a stormy day, we went out on the broken pier, and Kathy, so that's Kathy on the pier, on the broken pier, oh, as, nice. the, as the storm, the storm bat battled, battled against us, you know? Yes, yes. So that's, that's another one then, which is the two um, panels, um, just a diptych of the, so the same kind of sort of area, but on a mm. cam day, that was the cam before the storm. I see. And, um, and then the one down on, on the ground there is uh, the Aqua Alta, which is um, the, the, the Lee, the south channel of the Lee, which is where the studios are situated on the south channel of the, of the, the Lee, because Cork City is, is an island encircled by two channels, the north and the south. And yes. they start at the western, you know, they, they kind of sort of come together then again at the Port of Cork. So there's there's about 29 or 30 bridges. And um, twice, once or twice a year, there's a small boat making yard very close to the studio called Mehelmara, and they make curricks there. And every year there's a, a cork navigation, they call it, which is a circumnavigation of the city by, by boat. And they um, they traverse, you know, from the western side where the where the river comes in and then where we're divided into, into the two channels. So they start um, in the city, mm. they work up around under the bridges. But in this particular point here, the boats have to pull in and go for a cup of coffee because one of the footbridges which was a flat bridge across this which is a flat bridge across the river they couldn't get under so they had to wait until the the water dropped a little bit so that they could get under under this flat footbridge. Yeah. and they went for coffee at that point and uh you know mm. so that's where i captured them then you know but um, well, i was following them actually by foot and it's prone to a bit of flooding isn't it around there oh it is yeah well that that footbridge is always is always uh flooded you know when, when yeah. the tide is the high tide 
Mm-hmm. So uh, the Aqua Alta was inspired by the, the Venetian, um, you know, when they call it the, the high tide, when it comes up onto the keys. Yes. Aqua Alta. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, at the moment, I know, because when I contacted you first and we, we were chatting, you were engaged in uh, various projects to do with the islands around south, uh, the southern part of the country. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, I've um, I've been well. I suppose Cork being a city as well being an island, you know, it's it's and you know we're on a we're on a slightly bigger island ourselves. So, but the islands in West Cork um, have been a magnet for me for years, you know, and um, between the uninhabited and the and the inhabited islands. So, you know, a small boat that we had, um, a little small sailing boat, you know, we'd regularly go to the small islands and uh, the uninhabited ones mostly. And, um, you know, just they're, they've got so much kind of, um, that's such a sense of presence. And, um, you know, some of them have ruins left. And then others now during COVID have been bought, you know, by people who want a sort of quarantine island, you know, and we're looking at islands around the world. And really? two of them, in, yeah, two of them in particular are bought. Yeah. Site on well, just like literally off of um, you know, an auctioneer's um site. Yes. And um during during I think, during I, think I know the auctioneer too. Yeah. Daily. Is it? Yeah, I, I possibly it comes, daily. Yeah, that's right. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, but, I think um, he specializes in that. I just can't <laughs> so remember I, his first name. Dominic, I think. Dominic, that's it. Yeah. So um I have been then a, a, a novelist, poet novelist I know, William Wall, wrote a book called The Islands. And that book is actually no, a, a, a sort of more fleshed out version of that book is called Grace's Day. And the three islands, so the narrative really is about uh, this young girl who grows up on the first island, which is in West Cork and it's called Castle Island. And the narrative just follows her, but it's, it's more the geology and the ecology of the islands that I was interested in. So the three islands were the first one, Castle Island in, in West in Roaring Motor Bay. The second island is uh, the Isle of Wight in the South of England. And the third is, uh, the island Croshida, which is in the Bay of Naples. And okay. I've been on the first and the last island. I haven't been to the Isle of Wight and I'm hopefully going next week. Really? So, um, right. Yeah. So I just did a residency in uh, Illin, the West Cork Arts Centre, and uh, I concentrated on Castle Island when I was there because I've been on the island a couple of times myself. So it was really the, I suppose, the sense of place that William Wall created about the island in, in his book mm. and my being there, which was, I, I, I used both influences to, to create the work. And, uh, and then, so I, I just finished the residency there towards the end of April in the West Cork Arts Centre and uh, William Wall came down to do a reading from, you know, from the book. So he, did, mm. he read the, the excerpts about Castle Island itself. And um, so that island has just been bought actually as well. Apparently it's a French man. Yes. And if you go there, I went years and years ago, and then laterally I went with uh, two fishermen. You know, one of them, one of them, um, we were going on a trip out to the Fastnet Island, and uh, I just said to Danny, Danny Murphy, who's sadly died since, and I just said, Danny, is there any way we could stop at Castle Island? And uh, he said, Dasher, sure, the tide is grand. We'll pull in there. You know, so we went in and stopped for we had about two hours. You know, and I just yes. went off to another part of the island that I hadn't been to and did uh, some sketches and. You know, as I say, again, took photographs and, uh, you know, um, went on then, got back on the boat and continued on to uh, on to the Fastnet. Yes. And uh, so it was it was a magical day again. And, and that's just one of the, the, the elements I really like about the, the islands. You know, it's I know it's, it's and, just, and uh, is your intention to make a series uh, of, of work about that? Yeah, because um, so this was the first, I suppose, a couple of things got in the way, really, when I was started this initially you know between lockdown and everything else like that and uh, so then and then William Wall spends a lot of time in Italy actually he's got a place in Camogli which is um, about 20 kilometers from Genoa yes. and um, so um, we went to the launch of one of his books actually in, in Camogli last uh, last June and um, so anyway William is hard to get hold of because he he's literally kind of could be he's in Italy now <laughs> he left mm. on, on, on uh, the 11th so yeah. he um, he was luckily here, and he came he came down and he he read. So we had a, a that was a, literally the last day of my residency, and uh, we you know it was an open you know invitation to anyone who's around. So we had a nice little group of people, and um, 
William read as well, you know, so it was that was a nice finish actually for my for my residency in, in Ireland on that day. And that was, you know, that's that's my island, yes. my island aspect. Yeah. 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 Very good. Okay, before we look at some of your work, um, I just want to to uh, tell everybody about uh, another facet of your life. And that is something to do with your husband, David, <laughs> David uh, yeah. who just happens to be a chocolatier. That's right. <laughs> so tell us about his career very quickly and, and we'll, we'll show show some of his product as well. Well, he's, um, he, you know, he was always in the food business. His mm -hmm. uh, family had a food business in the city. And, uh, you know, so when he decided uh, he was going to take a step back, it was quite a very intensive, busy um, business. And um, I suppose a friend of his died when he was in 52 and David just decided he was going to take a, a relook, you know, a step back mm -hmm. Yeah. From a very kind of stressful kind of sort of job and we always loved chocolate well you know who doesn't I suppose and we were we were members of this chocolate society which was um it was organized by a guy called Ang Angus Tyrrell and um so he invited chocolate makers in Europe to um create chocolate for his tasting box mm -hmm. so it was like a tasting menu you know if you're tasting wine so the, yeah. the chocolates had a menu and they had a score scoring card and everything, you know, so that you'd actually, you, you could send back the information or not. You just, you know, otherwise just enjoy the chocolates. Mm. And um, so, yeah, so that's, we were getting the chocolates and, you know, I presume Dave might have been thinking, you know, I love chocolate. So, you know, he started investigating, mm. um, making, becoming a chocolatier, you know, and yeah. uh, so that was about uh, 12, 14 years ago. And um, so he had a place in the English market, which unfortunately at the start of COVID, you know, when it closed it, and then he kind of realized then he didn't really need it, you mm. know, in terms of, kind of sort of, he had it for a number of years, I suppose it got his brand out there a little bit more. And then he just, he supplies shops around the city now, you know, small um, artisan shops around the city. Yes. He didn't really want to go into the big, big <clears throat> supermarket end of things with the chocolate. So it's more, that would bring him back to where he was, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. So it's more mm. like the um, your Kikoa, you know, there's all keeps up in St. Luke's, you know, small, small, I suppose, like local mm. shops that supply good food. And yeah. um, so that's that's and then, you know, he, he, he's, he doesn't have a distributor. So furthest east we'd go would be the cafe in Lismore Castle mm. and then down to West Cork as well. And then when neighbor food happened, neighbor food was this during lockdown, it took off as well. And when people couldn't go to supermarkets, you know, this uh, neighbor food set up. Uh, well, it was it was there, actually, but it really took off during lockdown where local suppliers of food, you know, um, were able to put their food up on this like platform. Mm. And you 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 sort of looked at what was online, you know, any any every type of food, you know, that you could imagine um, our grower and supplier and um, but all all literally kind of sort of very good, very good quality. And uh, so that took off and David was one of the people he at the at the start of uh, lockdown 2020 in March, he had a load of Easter eggs made. Mm. And when everything shut down, he said, what am I going to do with my Easter eggs, you know, and then put got onto the platform, the, the neighbor food platform and um, sold all his Easter eggs. And that was the <laughs> that was the start of um, neighbor food. Now, neighbor food seems to have taken a little step down again once people got into going back to shops. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. still there but just the, the the busyness of it has has kind of just um, reduced a little bit was, that, was that a monster phenomenon or or was it all over well, it, was Ireland? Actually, it was actually all around the country was and um, yeah. yeah yeah so okay. the guy who bought the franchise for core well for for the country really um yeah. he's known he's known as the rocket man yes. and um he's actually got an italian partner now and is living in italy now and his mother simone runs the business here in in, in court right. still you know but okay. they really sort of were, were kind of the people behind it you know but um yeah Very so it's uh, yeah uh, you don't happen to have any chocolates there by any chance do you uh, well there's always chocolates not that hand. you can give me one but you can show it to everybody <laughs> if i can look at it if i can no, pass it over to you where am i no over it over Left, there <laughs> david and what's yeah. the, what's the website uh, it's David L. Shorten. Um, right now, what's the website? Oh, no. I think it's, it's, it's not just David Chocolatier or something. Oh, yeah. Sorry. It says davidchocolatier.com. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's it. I'll, I'll put that underneath the um, description on the video. 
Um, Tim Goulding is asking, what's the name of that food platform? Neighbor it's food? Neighbor, neighbor food. Neighborhood food. No, neighbor, neighbor food. Oh, neighbor food. Yeah, neighbor food. Hope it would have been in West Cork as well, Tim. Um, we may, I, I don't know, did, it, did you have it in Allahy's? But it was very active around Bally de Hob, Skibreen, um, you know, Lissaverd, Lis Lis all, I don't know, yeah, maybe it didn't get as far as West as uh, Allahy's. Yeah. You haven't come across it, Tim, have you? Oh, no, we won't, we won't be asking him that now. We'll talk about oh, yeah, that okay. later. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get on with the business at hand. All right. Okay. So listen, that's wonderful. And if you, if you get your hands on the, those chocolates, uh, they, they are, by all accounts, absolutely superb, really top quality. So well done to David on that. I hope it succeeds, continues to succeed. Thank um, you. Well, I'm, I'm one of his chief tasters, Alan. So, uh, you know. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's a tough number. And tell me, does he is a separate studio to you? Oh, he does. Yeah, he um, I actually had my eyes in his studio, you know, thinking when when he gets bigger, yeah. I'll be able to get I'll be able to get my hands on the studio. But in fact, it hasn't happened yet, you know, okay. because my, my time in the um, in the uh, art in the studio inside, there's only a 12 year max on that. And I'm in the 12th year. I should have been out in June. But yes. I got a COVID extension, which will bring me up to the end of the year. Okay. And um, and then I've just start. we'll have to adapt uh, a space, you know, so mm. he's still in his chocolate studio anyway. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're very fortunate. <laughs> um, right. Let's have a look at some of your work, Angie. And I'm going to let you talk through the various images we're going to see now. OK. OK. And starting with these two. So. This is actually going back to, you know, the start of my career, really. But I put them in because they've been... An, a Your seminal, graduation, wasn't it? Your graduation yeah, project? Yeah. yeah, they've been seminal, really, as an influence in my work. You know, just the linear mode pattern keeps recurring, you know, and I, I, I'm just drawn to it. And I suppose I'm just sort of, you know, look, looking for that kind of motif, really. So the, this was a dress uh, my elder sister had. Um, you know, and it's satin, made of satin, but it was just, uh, I, I suppose Bridget Riley would have been, you know, the, the kind of optical illusion of her work was was kind of sort of evident as well in terms of, of just not in my work now, but just I was aware of her. And um, so, yeah, I, the, these two paintings in particular, I did a whole series based on this dress. And um, so the one on the left won um, a painting award at the Taylor Bequest Awards at the RDS. And the one on the right, the one on the left is satin sation, and the one on the right then is tight fish. And I was living in Waterford for, for a short period of time. And I, I that one um, on the right called tight fish won the um, Southeast Vision Award, which was selected by James White of the um, National, National Gallery. Gallery. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so they, yeah, they, they, that, that pattern has just fed into my work. Yeah. And that's oil but, on board canvas. What? that's that's oil on canvas yeah canvas. and um i was painting in oils all the time at that mm -hmm. stage and mm -hmm. but then i just became too sensitive the i just became sensitized to the actual terps and um yeah. solvents a number mm -hmm. of years of the solvents yeah and uh, just had to move away from and I, I adapted acrylic then just to suit my way of working you know and um, i know i could go back to oils now again because you know there's alkaline um substances and you know, I, but I just haven't sort of changed back from the acrylic, really. I, I adapted the acrylic just to, to suit my way of working. And it's, you, it's a nice kind of yeah. multimedia kind of um, type of paint as well, you know. Sure. Um, Angie, have you tried the water mixable oils? I haven't actually, no, no. Have you tried them, I, Alan? I, yeah, I use them all the time. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Not that I do a lot of oil painting, but I, that's what I use. And they're okay. so easy to clean your brushes afterwards. And there's no, you know smell or anything it's tremendous yeah i mean that'd be worth I'm trying a, now having said that they're probably you know a purist would probably say they're a load of rubbish and they're very difficult to work with and they don't give the same effect but um it's worth trying out anyway but do, do you different. get the drying time out of them like you would with oil i mean do you the, much the, the same the, as oils same as oils. okay yeah okay. Pro probably weave it faster but all right you know, not much yeah anyway these these are wonderful paintings what size would they be um, well, I've got one Roughly. there, and the, I, I still have the one on the left, which I, I there's certain paintings I've hung on to because they were 
sort of seminal pieces, as I say. And um, so that one is, um, gosh, that's about, um, I'd have to go over measure. I'd nearly have to go over measure. Yeah. Um, it's about uh, three by four. Yeah, feet. three by four, I'd say, in around that. That's feet yeah, so nine. quite large, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gorgeous, I love you. I love them. Thank you. So then these, these are later on, actually, these are like in the last 10 years, but like the dress, which was at my, you know, in, at my fingertips, basically, because it was my, my sister's, um, but it was the being drawn to the linear pattern again. Um, mm. So a friend of mine had this and she said, she said, Angie, I think you could find use with this. And it's actually, it's called the Riviera changing tent. So it's a it's a changing tent for one person. So it's it's 1930s, you know, and yes, um, yes. it actually all folds up into into a bag, which is has a, a wooden two half um, wooden um, rounds, and they when you when you open up the bag, the two half um, wooden kind of pieces then become this the circle the whole circle at the top, yeah, and the whole tent falls out of out of the bag basically. So there's four parts to it with, with four pieces of metal, the pole, which fits together. And then the tent hangs off the pole. So mm. the fact that it was, and you just stick it into the, the sand or the, you know, into the mm. earth yes. and, uh, you can, and you can weigh it then with stones as well. But the fact that um, it was, uh, it was called the R Riviera changing tent. I mean, there's a brilliant kind of brochure with it, you know, which just shows a woman in sort of 1930s style clutching, clutching this bag on her way to the beach. Um, but I, I thought just introducing it into the, the rugged West Cork landscape was uh, kind of an interesting, an interesting element, you know. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, it just, um, and it, it actually just kind of really worked with the landscape too. Um, so, you know, rather than weighing it down, I, I just kind of left it flow with the wind. So mm -hmm. this one in particular now, this one was um, start of 1920, uh, 2020. Yes. And it was mm -hmm. January in 2020. And just the light at that time of the year I really love the light at that time of the year I mean it's 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 kind of it's spare but it's just got a lovely quality and um so this was out in Barley Cove and sometimes in the winter they take there's a, a beat um a sort of one of these bridges that they they put across um the sort of causeway at the back of the beach yes but during the the winter they take that away because of the storms the storms have mm. wrecked it at different times so yeah. this was the back part of the beach, which um, so the, the sea is on the other side of that um, dune in front yeah. of in front of us there, mm -hmm. and um, but I just really liked the the feel of this place here, you know, with the water, just the kind of residue of water, and yes. um, and I and just left the the tent just just below, Plopping you know, away. just very gently, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, but it, it was at the start. I started I started it in January 2020, and um, and then I was working on it in the studio when lockdown happened, mm -hmm. and I hadn't finished it. And I said I'd go back in to collect it. And when I went in, like at that stage, we were kind of asked not to go. Not you know, the the, the studios were following the line of the galleries, you know, mm -hmm. closing. And yes. uh, but we have our own individual key to go into the studios anyway. So I went in to collect this painting, and uh, and I just kind of thought. Gosh, it's, it's quite big now. Maybe I'll just um, do a bit of work here. So I actually finished it in mm. there. I spent a couple of days going back and forth and uh, finished it in there. And it just kind of in that time, you know, that time of, of kind of worrying people didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. It just felt like an achievement to have finished that yeah. at the start of, you know, that that March lockdown. I know. And, and, you know, and then I called it when the tide went out, which, you know, literally and metaphorically, yes. Yes. it just... Um, the title just seemed to work and um, so I sent it up to the Ulster uh, RUA the Royal Ulster Academy mm -hmm. the exhibition that happens there yes and that was up there um, in the like late tw uh, 2020 and uh, but of course it, the exhibition opened for a couple of days and then it closed down mm -hmm. but they recorded the whole exhibition mm -hmm. and um, so so there's actually there's, there is a sort of a recording of the um, the RUA have a recording of the actual whole exhibition, you know. Yeah. But, uh, funny, when, when, when you when you realise when you did that and the circumstances surrounding it, it yeah. throws a completely different perspective on the painting itself. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And actually, that, that painting now is hanging in um, the um, I, I sent it down to the Mill Cove Gallery in uh, Kenmare, mm -hmm. and um, then the Brennan brothers, John and oh, Francis. Right. 
yeah. we're doing up the latest hotel, which is the Lansdowne in Kinmare. Yeah. And um, so they they bought a lot of art from mm -hmm. the um, Milcove and other probably other places as well. And uh, that was one of the paintings they bought, and that's hanging in the foyer of the Lansdowne Hotel. Is now. it really? Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. So that's great. It's a lovely, great spot to have it, actually, you know, because yeah. um, I had a cousin who was there recently because his daughter's getting married in in uh, Kenmare in June. Mm -hmm. And he was just in the hotel because, they, you know, they're booking rooms all over the town. And um, they were looking at the painting and then they spotted my name at the end of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so he, he lives in America, you know, so it was... Yeah. Um, God, yeah, Angie, they'll all be taking selfies in front of it now. I know. Well, that actually, that's great. I'd, <laughs> I'd be happy. <laughs> Very good. OK. So then these were, um, you know, water influenced again. So for the last number of years, I, I'm, I'm, I've been, you know, working, doing an awful lot of work, you know, with the islands and everything and just w water in, inspired um, the element of water. And um, so these ones on the way, you know, if you're heading out to getting into a boat or just going to mm. the island or, you know, getting in, literally going for a swim even. Usually you're you're walking down, you know, maybe jumping off a pier or going down yes. steps into a boat. Yes. So I was, you know, I, I suppose in one sense, I've always kind of uh, looked at the close up view of things like the the initial ones there of the striped dress, you know, the kind of as close close up view, you know, the zoned in view. And this this was the same with these ones that I was just started to look instead of the kind of broader sort of scape in front of me. Mm -hmm. I was looking down and, and I suppose star steps as well. They they're like scarred markers of history in, in, in one sense, you know, the actual kind of sort of the ebb and flow of the tide, but the kind of toing and froing of people, you know, the passage of people, you know, between yes. trade and 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 commerce and and uh you know just people Leisure. even immigration, you yeah. know. So, mm. so steps have had a kind of a huge resonance with me. Steps into into water have had a huge resonance with for me as well, um, because of that whole kind of sort of the transitional kind mm. of point, you know, the liminal space, if you like, you know, stepping off, um, and that transitional point of just going from one place to another, which yeah. is um, it's it's just has that kind of that particular resonance for me as well, you know, yeah. um, and then the seaweed, the seaweed just as, as a kind of a point as well, because uh, I did a seaweed course actually with this woman, um, Franny Rattigan, she's up in Sligo actually. Mm -hmm. And um, she was in West Cork for the, for the taste, of, uh, taste of West Cork. And uh, she did a seaweed course. So seaweed has always had a, between trying, trying it as a food source, but you know, just as a bathing in it, because seaweed, I've had plenty of seaweed baths. <laughs> yep, so, and a fertilizer um, as well. And a fertilizer as well, yeah. So mm. um, you know, seaweed, seaweed is kind of sort of pops up regularly as well in my work. You know, I just love the the actual, yeah. Because one of the this one in particular on on the right, um, I did a close up version of that seaweed, um, which is is like a, a still life, I suppose, in a sense. But it's 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 in the water, which is translucent, mm. and I mean, it's it's a beautiful, it's a this yeah. seaweed, you know, that yes, it is. Yeah, 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 gorgeous, uh, beautiful, beautiful, shape. yeah. Mm. Now here's a series as well that, that that again I think um sort of points to the Celtic tiger and yeah so this um, mm -hmm. after the the series of the exhibition I had in 2007 where I did the the barracks the former former cavalry barracks which was set up by the British Army in, in the seven, late 1700s so there was a lot of, of corrugated huts in, in that space as well. And that led me on to the kind of sort of the corrugated hut or shed. Um, and I suppose the vertical stripe again, you know, with the with the, the nature of the corrugated iron. All right. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So that that was the sort of uh, the, 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 the draw again here for me, you know, as, as well as the vernacular architecture of the of the, the sheds, which were during the Celtic Tiger were, were starting to disappear left, right and centre as places were being developed. Yeah. And um, so I started a lot of the work, which would would have been probably after that uh, 2007 exhibition. So up to maybe 20, 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. And um, so this one is, is timber, but um, if leading the way to the sea again, you know, and just the, uh, the, the proximity to, to, to water, you know, this one was... Yes. Um, like, you know, whether it was a storage or, you know, mm. um, but it just had a, a certain kind of abandonment. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, about, yeah. 
But uh, and this one then, um, this one I called a disused shed in County Cork, and it was inspired by Derek Mahan's poem, "A Disused Shed in County Wexford." And um, I love poetry. I love, you know, I'm, I'm a big reader as well. But poetry is a, is a kind of a, a has a big influence for me as well. And um, so I, I happened to meet Derek Mahan at the West Cork Literary Festival, and he signed his book, Collected Poems, for me. And um, so one of the sheds when I was working on it, I just called it a disused shed in County Cork after his a disused shed in County Wexford, and that all the all those paintings then were part of the Engage Arts Festival in Bandon, which um, was it's at the moment now it hasn't happened in the last number of years. Well, COVID again, but up to COVID, um, it, it was going on for a number of years and it was really, really good arts festival in Bandon, County Cork. And anyway, I had an exhibition in the town hall of all, literally nearly all, all the kind of shed work. And um, unknowns to me, will, um, Derek Mahan was scheduled to read in the room, in the, in, in, in the room where I had my exhibition. And um, so I was in the audience and he started to read and then he read his first poem and then he kind of looked up around and he said, made a comment about the work and he said, is the artist in the room? So I put up my hand. Hmm. And um, so we became, we became friends actually, yeah. And he was a lovely man. And he, he, he asked me then to illustrate, um, he, he said he loved huts and sheds and he, he produced this for the gallery press where his publisher is. And then this was like a chat book, um, hmm. which, they, which they produced. And um, so he asked me to, you know, would I provide him with some illustrations for this? And as uh, which I did, I was uh, very delighted and honoured to to do, and um, yeah, so that uh, that was kind of came on from the from the the sheds, and then and is this, this is this part of it, yeah. This isn't directly part of the sheds, but this this is written by Derek Mahan, and I had told him the story about finding two baby dead blackbirds in in the ashtray of a stove, and. Um, they had fallen down the chimney and I hadn't been there in the house. And when I kind of opened the, the stove and was pulling out the ashtray, I got the shock of my life when I found these two birds in the stove in the in the tray. And um and I was telling um with Derek Mahan about it and uh and he wrote the piece mm. for me. And so the you know it was just such a beautiful piece, you know, because he made the small story, you know, the story of finding the blackbirds in the in the ashtray into yeah. just this, like, you know, this global kind of, you know, piece which has such incredible res resonance for homelessness and, and everything now as well, because it's, um, you know, it's just an amazing, amazing kind of, um, which, of course, Derek Mahan would, would write, you know. Sure, um, yeah. So, yeah, so, and, you know, that's a piece that he said, that's for you, so I'll never sell that. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but um, yeah. then, so this is, the image that's on the front of that chapbook, which is the um, the window on the left, mm -hmm. and that was in this former bakery um, industrial building in the centre of Skibbereen, and it was at one stage a workhouse as well. So it was from the this is it actually, and this is the building um, before it was demolished to make way for the West Cork Art Centre. Illin, the West Cork Art Centre, now stands on the footprint of this building. All right. So. Yeah. Um, so I did um, an exhibition of work with two other um, colleagues who were, um, and the work, so when we went into the building at the time, four floors of, of a building, and, mm. you know, we had to climb up ladders and to get into each floor, but mm. um, found a load of um, the baking tins, you know, for bread and everything that was just kind of last of the, the, the sort of the, the history of the building was just left there, lying there, yeah. you know, and um, so like you the old way. Yeah, and then the kind of stack of of um of tins and all sorts of stuff. So wool, wolves were the people who had the bakery, and um and they they did a very good kind of sort of deal for the for the West Cork Art Centre to um to be able to acquire the the site. All right. You know. So, yeah. so the the Illin now the West Cork Art Centre. That's where I did my residency just recently. So it's you know it all kind of you know comes back around again, and um. So these ones then are the docklands in Cork, and these are close enough to where I live. And during this was back in 2011, time around again because these were in the RHA in 2011. And um, so I was coming home from the theatre one night, and actually I was at the theatre again last night. Yeah. And um, 
I just driving past this is the bonded near the bonded warehouses in Cork, which is like where the two channels of the river come together again. Mm -hmm. And as it flows towards the sea then, and um, these beautiful, like the bonded warehouses would have been where, you know, storing for wine, you know, for people who wanted to who bring wine into the country and they'd yeah. be kept in bonded warehouses until then they were, you know, moved out to the um, point of sale. Mm -hmm. And so these the corrugated roof again caught my, caught my eye and just the way the light was hitting it. And yes. I just had to. You know, I think I dropped Dave home and came back in. <laughs> and um, it's just such, a, you know, it just, as I say, it just really just kind of caught uh, just so much kind of um, a sense of drama. And sure. I suppose maybe just coming from theatre as well, it just it fed into into that for me, you know, like a stage setting, you know. But, um, you know, at the moment as well now, these buildings are in sort of, you know, in a kind of limbo, you know, that we're hoping they're going to be, kept and and meant well there's a preservation on these parts themselves but there's mm. still at the same time you know new development kind of plans for around them which we hope won't affect the actual integrity of these incredible yeah. buildings the yeah. historic buildings that they are tell me angie so, is there a certain hopper uh yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah well spotted alan yeah, thanks <laughs> um, well, <laughs> When I was in when I was in art college, um, I suppose my you know the, the, I was looking more towards I suppose the Western you know influence um, mm. and you know the, the the artists like Popper and Wyeth and um, that sort of section of of uh, the the period slice of of, of um, American art was the kind of what appealed to me and uh, yeah so definitely because um, even actually when I was in in when I was doing the principles of teaching art um, and I did that filmmaking. Like I did a whole series of filmmaking mm. um, yes. and little videos. Hopper's Nighthawks comes into one of my little videos, you know. Mm. So um, you know, it's it's yeah. it's the resonance kind of coming back around again, you know. But um, I, I just love the colour in that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that. there are small pieces actually, you know. Are they? Things. All right. Yeah. Now this so, is the one we saw in your studio. Yeah, and that's um that was again like focusing on the river because you know there's this whole kind of sort of save the lee you know the campaign um because of the flooding you know there's a whole big kind of sort of campaign in terms of trying to prevent walls being built you know yeah. um anyway that's a kind of a different story but i just started focusing on the the river again you know as a kind of a, a just such an incredible resource and amenity i mean the wildlife that's in the in the river is just between sand martens i've seen otters um cormorants kingfishers you know every kind of wildlife along this because this is my usual walk into into this into my studio so mm -hmm. this this is the south channel of the of the river and um so this comes along george's quay and then you know up towards um eventually towards finbar's cathedral and then wandsford quay where 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 i'm where my studio is situated yes. and as I say, when the Corkham navigation, when they were going around, my niece was actually in this boat, one of the boats, because she was involved with building um, a curragh in, in Mehalmara. And uh, so that, that was sort of one of the reasons I followed them. I was following them as well. And then they went in for coffee while they waited for the, the, the water to drop below the footbridge. Mm, yeah. Um, the footbridge beside the School of Commerce, which mm. is our Bauhaus influenced building in the city. And, um, but yeah, so. This, this is where, where this painting came from and like the steps are just you know the step these are beautiful limestone steps they're all around um the city between the different you know the north channel the south channel mm -hmm. like they're they're just i mean the walls i mean it's such, such a beautifully created um channel yeah. channels for for the for the river and on both sides yes that were yes. you know i mean concrete walls on top. anyway but no. that's um so, and I discovered actually, I was reading a book then laterally, um, and it was about the transportation of, of um, people to South, you know, to Australia and Van Diemen's Land. And, um, but there was one book which was called The Wreck of the Neva, which I was reading. And um, because the old Elizabeth Fort is very close to the studios, and, um, and we were doing, um, the Backwater Artists Group were doing an exhibition in the, in the fort between mm -hmm. the, the Lava Gallery and the fort. So we were using former Garda barracks that was in the in the Elizabeth Fort as a for showing our work as well. And um, so 
like I, I was reading this book at the time just to find out a little bit more about Elizabeth Fort and somebody recommended this book called The Wreck of the Neva. And it was about just um, a collection of, of women who were brought from all around the country for misdemeanors, could have been any kind of slight thing. Maybe somebody in the family didn't like this particular woman or whatever. Yeah. And they were all gathered. So it could have been anything at all. You know what I mean? And mm. they weren't convicts, you know, but they were all gathered from all around the country and brought and brought into Elizabeth Fort. And then they were then brought and um, brought from there along the Keys and mm. put onto a tender where they were then brought down to Cove and put onto this ship called the Neva. So they mm. would have been brought down to the steps here. And yes. I didn't know that at the time when I was reading, when I, I had been working on this painting and then I was reading the book and mm. I discovered these were the steps that the women would have been brought down and into loaded in, into the tender yeah. and then brought from there down to Cove and then put onto the ship. And this was in January and they were saying like they, they weren't even adequately dressed for the kind of sort of like the winter here. Mm. They were kind of sort of given clothes that would have suited the southern climes, but not for the, the northern climes before they left. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it was a fascinating read. Absolutely fascinating. fascinating. Read. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. And uh, as I say, I got I had a chill at the, you know, up my spine when I realized they were the steps that they, the women were brought down, you know. I and, bet. Uh, yeah. And that boat actually, see, the, it was called the Wreck of the Never because that ship um, floundered off, didn't reach Australia. So there was only a handful of the women actually um, survived. All, all the crew survived and a handful of women survived. Yes. And um, so their descendants are. Was it just wrecked off, off the coast of Australia? Just off the coast of Australia. Yeah. 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 Gosh, that's an incredible so, uh, story. Oh, it's an incredible story. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. This, move. this one is, is one of the silos going back to the Docklands area again, and mm -hmm. this is a grain silo on the on the Docklands area, and this came about um, uh, going back to um, our mutual friend Bridget Flannery, mm -hmm. my friend and colleague, um, painter, fabulous painter, and um, so Bridget and myself worked on a project. We were in college around the same time, and um, at the start of last year, we um, there was a small studio inside in the backwater, um, which is uh, called the project. It's Studio 12, and it can be a project space or an exhibition space. So we applied. I applied for that. For the for we both applied for that, and um, we were kind of sort of. It was the influence of water again, as during lockdown, mm. I was walking the river around the river in Cork and down to the Docklands area, which is not far from where I'm living here now. And uh, Bridget was walking the, the Barrow in Carlow, where she's living. And uh, well, Bridget was swimming as well, but I did. I decided I wasn't going to swim in the Lee. And um, mm -hmm. anyway, so that project came about um, through our mutual. We kind of work differently, but our influences are are you know very much the same. Yes. And um, so <clears throat> this was one of the pieces that came um, from from that uh, project mm. uh, time that we did in the in the backwater. Yeah. And it was uh, a very interactive kind of sort of project that where we encouraged people who were coming to visit us to uh, engage in drawing into a long concertina sketchbook that we had just about how they got to the studio. And quite yes. more often than not, you have to traverse the river, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so we had this like big, long um, sort of like a map making process, really. Um, and it, it was just really it was a kind of a great piece to engage with with people who came in yeah. um so it, and then we had um in my pavon she's a she's a an amazing incredible um dancer she choreographs an awful lot of of, of um like she's worked with artists a lot as well so Inma came in then and we asked Inma to come in and she responded to our work um mm. so it was just no music or anything involved but it was just this kind of silent um approach from Imma to a, a response to our work, which was in this beautiful small space of the, um, the Studio 12 project space. And the building, you see, where the studios are, are a former mill as well. So there's just an incredible um, resonance of history in them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a lovely little small space that the, um, the backwater has now as, as, a, as, a, as an in-house studio space. I mean, other, you know, people can apply for to, to have an exhibition there, you know, and yeah, so that, that one again is a lithograph and it's um, X marks the tree and it's from the um, that landscape the, where the cavalry barracks in Ballancolig, the former army barracks. Yes. And it was, you know, a lot of the trees had X's, the trees that were going to be taken down had an X marked oh, on them. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to keep 
because it was 90 acres, they had to keep a certain amount of the, the, you know, the trees and everything in there. But the trees that were deemed not fit were put, had an X put on them and they were the ones that were going to be taken down. So yeah. this one was um, just, you know, I, I, I had another painting called X marks the tree in the felling time. And this one is X marks the tree. And this is a lithograph, which I really love the, the, that medium as well, lithography, because it's drawing directly onto stone and mm. stone. So other people have used the stone before. So it, it's a limestone, Bavarian limestone. And stone has a resonance as well from the previous people who've actually worked on it. And then you, you erase the image, the previous image. But, you know, stone holds memory. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting. Um, like, like your steps as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then this one, um, you know, the, how, how the seasons influence my work. Um, and we don't get, we don't get um, snow in, in Ireland or even in Cork that often, but um, this was one of the snow days. Mm. And, uh, my, um, it, was, it was starting to kind of sort of fade in Cork, or disappear in Cork. And I, I went out to, um, out to Dripsy where my brother and my mother lived. And there was still some snow left. And this was an old car that he had. He was into classic cars and he had it covered with a, uh, with a you know sort of some cover which kind of just seemed to blend with the snow as well yes. so that was just um you know I just called it relic and uh so that was just the, the one of the, the seasonal influences in my work yes. so I've done I've done a lot of portraits over the time um and one of the first portraits that apart from the self portrait that I did in art college um but then I went um uh, you know Betty Bella and um, Jacqueline Stanley set up this Arnett's National Portrait Exhibition back in the 80s. Yes. And so I did this portrait of my brother Paul, who was the youngest member in our family, and he next in age to me, in fact. And I had to, you know, he was about 19, didn't know what he wanted to do in life at that stage. And I had nearly had to bribe him, I think, to come down and sit for me. So this was the kind of tight fit again, you know, yeah. like going back to the, the one of the striped painted dress. And um, so that's, the background is actually the barracks trees again that were in the barracks. So I had this lovely Oriel room studio, which had, you know, just up on the, on the next uh, high uh, first floor mm -hmm. and just had a lovely vantage point. And um, so that was in 86, 1986. And then this one here is one that I did of him last year because unfortunately my brother got cancer and uh, I just said, oh, I need to do another portrait of him. So mm -hmm. this was after chemo and he'd lost his hair and um, I, you know, he loves hats. And yes. I just said, well, pick a hat, you know, and we were trying all sorts of hats. And, uh, um, you know, this one was the one we chose. And then the red coat, um, which is kind of like a, a, a life force in itself, you know, um, mm -hmm. he had it made when he thought he had beaten cancer, but unfortunately he didn't, you know. But so I had said I had to include the, the red oh, coat. Absolutely. Well. Yeah. I'm so, so, I'm so sorry to hear that. Thank, thanks very much, Alan. Mm. So that was just at the end of January when he passed. But <laughs> it was a, a big influence, let's put it that way. Yes. Now, there's a this bit one, of story behind this, isn't there? There is. Um, hmm. So this one, um, these would have been two friends of ours, Alex and, and well, Uli was our kind of friend, really. He was Northern Ita uh, Italian from in the Alto Adige region, um, Bolzano area. And uh, so he had, a, he had a girlfriend from Austria, um, from Vienna. We went to stay with her, but she, um, so this was, we went to Schon, the Schonbrunn Palace, which is in, in, uh, in Vienna, and um, a fabulous gardens, a fabulous palace as well, but um, anyway, so I, I, I decided to do this portrait, but unknowns to me, I didn't realise there were kind of, I was, must have been reading something into the uh, setting, because like, you know, they, they're not together any longer, let's put it that way, but I must have read something <laughs> into the situation. <laughs> Well, this is what I thought when I when I saw that I said to you, oh, so do they do they cut the picture in half and keep one each? <laughs> <laughs> no, I still have that myself. <laughs> so that was in the RHA in uh, two thousand and five. Oh, was it? So it was, yeah. So it's called Portrait for a Longing. Yeah. So it it kind of says a lot as well, I suppose. It does, you know, it does. Okay. And then the um, so the one on the right is the pastel portrait of Michael Collins. Um, I did a lot of pastel work as well. Now I haven't actually used any pastel lately. But this was commissioned by the Office of Public Works. And um, so when I was when I was working on that, they told me they wanted like a color, you know, and obviously there was only black and white photos of, of, of Michael Collins around. So I um, I used the same portrait or photograph that Tim Pat Coogan used on the cover of his book. Yeah. And um, but when I was working on it, my my mother and my aunt were living with us at the time. And um, 
my aunt would have been 12 when Michael Collins, she was born in 1910. And um, so she remembers like when Michael Collins was killed, you know, and um, so he, you know, she said it was the only time like she saw her father really upset, you know, and mm. um, but like at the time when I was working on this, um, my, my, I had a studio, I was kind of working from from home at the time and my my mother and my aunt used every morning on their way down, they'd pop in and they'd say, how's Michael coming along? <laughs> <laughs> so he really became like a living presence, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the one on the left is actually one I did of my my husband, Dave, the chocolate David. man back in, um, yeah, David back in, uh, gosh, um, that's back in probably the 80s as well. Is it? So, yeah. Uh, so and we're, going, we're, going to, we're going to finish on a, on a lovely portrait of you. Yeah, so that one was around the time that I was in the Lavish as well, the Lavish mm -hmm. Gallery when I was artist in residence there. So that's the early 90s. Yeah. And um, so that one, yeah, I used a combination, like it's the trompe l'oeil effect, you know, the sort of, you know, and um, so the background is, so that's, that's uh, the background is acrylic actually, the, the floral yes. background is acrylic and then the, the rest of it is oil. Um, and it's, um, that's, yeah, gosh, I probably, that might have been in Ireland as well now, I'm trying to think, yeah. But, it was 93. Um, 93, yeah, 93. Yeah, yeah. it was still going at, at that stage. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I saw actually, I, I, you know, I'm going to do another portrait, actually, like one of the sort of more contemporary one now again, you know, um, that was the last one I did. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Listen, thank you so much for that. Thank you uh, very much. Alan. I'm just going to go through some of the comments and then we'll open it out to everybody. Funula. Uh, Lanigan says incredible story I think that's referring to the wreck of the Neva and yeah. Anne Rath says the same amazing work love the story of that Bridget Flannery wonderful experience to work with Angie and Inma um, Pat Higginson says looks like a scene from Fargo the covered car <laughs> in the snow love it Teresa. Uh, Liam sorry I missed the start uh, fascinating stories regarding recording of social his history absolutely uh, thank you both. We'll look again on YouTube. Um, Louise Clark says, great to see lots of your work. Maria Gabriella says, great work, Angie. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Berna says, great interview. Well done. A uh, very interesting artist. Uh, thanks a million. Wonderful insight into Angie's work. OK, thanks for that. Uh, yes, because this is the first time I've joined. Yes. Super. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to twiddle about while the <laughs> event was happening, and I'll be very brief, because but to say this is my first time and my second name is Connolly, yeah, which I also don't know how to put on yet. But don't anyway, <laughs> thank you. As a first time um, encounter, uh, Angie, I really enjoyed your work. I'll leave it at that because others have no doubt more extensive things to say. Thank you, Alan. OK, thanks for that. <laughs> Anybody else? Cathy? Yeah, have I come up as well? I don't don't know if my camera. Yeah, no, you're there. You're there. We can see you. Okay. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> Hi. I just wanted to say thank you. I, I, I was stunned by that painting, so I, I just felt I had to. Which one, Kathy? She she had a painting of me in the studio from her time in Kilreely. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. It's yeah. the first time myself and Angie really met. Yeah. And mm. had such a great time together. And yeah. such, a, such a great support ever since. I'm so grateful to know you and your work. It's just well, been tremendous. Well, like, likewise, Kathy, it was it was um that that time in Kilreely was was great. I mean, we we got work out of it too, you know, as well as getting a bit of you know still, socializing. Still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm into the future. I look forward to more. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. Anybody else before we go? Yes, I'd like to say yeah. I loved hearing Angie's voice yes. speaking to the paintings and the backstory of each one. It's such important work, I feel. Thanks, Angie. Thanks very much, Anne. That's Anne, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Th and thank you for that, Anne. Thank yeah. you. Angie, thank you so much. That was thank absolutely spectacular. Um, you're, you're, you're a wonderful storyteller. And Thank an you. even better artist. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Alan. Yeah, not, I really not, enjoyed it. You know, it was a bit nerve wracking initially. You know, before the thought, the thought of it and everything. But as I say, you know, you yeah. make it very easy. You know, you right. really do. 
I, pr I probably didn't I probably didn't help what I told you about our extensive reach throughout the globe. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you, you did fabulously well. And thank you so thank much you. for that. Uh, I wish you er continued success and and to David as well. Thank you. I hope thank everyone you. goes out and buys his chocolates because they are beautiful. All right. Thank you, very much. Thank yeah. you everyone for watching. And um, we'll see you in two weeks time, possibly even a week's time. We're working out a little schedule to get a very special guest on. And um, that, that may happen either this sa coming Saturday or the following one. But thank you all for joining. Enjoy the rest of the week, our weekend, and uh, see you soon again. So thanks. Bye. Bye.